Namaste. So now we're going to continue this series on Aparokshanubhuti, which is a step-by-step -step explanation of the sadhana to attain liberation, jnana yoga. So this will be the invocation. In the previous episode, we discussed the overview. And now we're going to begin with the book itself, including some preliminary prayers. But first of all, I want to discuss the Sanskrit of Aparokshanubhutihi. The Sanskrit of Aparokshanubhutihi can be broken up into syllables. A, pa, ro, ksha, nu, bhu, ti, hi. And this is a rhythmic sound. It has a time signature. It has a matra, which means a meter. And here I've illustrated it with a kind of Morse code. Dit, dit, da, da, dit, da, dit, dit. So it's pronounced with a meter. Aparo, ksha, nu, bhu, ti, hi. Aparo, ksha, nu, bhu, ti, hi. And the meaning of the separate components of this compound word are apara, having nothing beyond or after, having no rival or superior, uksha, large, great, anu, according to, severally, each by each, orderly, methodically, one after another, repeatedly, bhuti, power or influence. So in other words, this work, aparokshanu bhutihi, is a step-by-step -step method of approaching the supreme destination, that destination beyond which there is nothing greater, beyond which there is nothing, actually, <laughs> because this is everything. Brahman is everything. So once one understands the nature of this book, then there's really nothing further to know. And what remains is only doing the sadhana, doing the work to realize it. And the next thing I want to discuss since we brought up the subject of meter, is the meter of the Sanskrit poetry used in this work. This meter, or chanda, is known as anushtup. Anushtup chanda is the meter of Sri Aparokshanubhutihi. It's a very common and popular matra used in many Vedic works like Mahabharata, Bhagavad Gita, and so on. And it's a Sanskrit poetic matra of 32 syllables. Each shloka or verse has four padas or feet of eight syllables. And you'll come to recognize this rhythm as we go into the Sanskrit. And they're usually combined into two lines of 16 syllables each. The first line is terminated with a single vertical line, and the second line is terminated with a double vertical line. So this is the meter, a very common meter, used in actually popular Sanskrit works. Huh? As if there isn't any such thing today, but in, back in the days there was most common people could understand at least a little bit of Sanskrit. So the popular works like Bhagavad Gita, Mahabharata, Ramayana, and so on, are all written in Anushtup Chanda. The story of how this meter was discovered or created is very interesting. Ramayana was written by Valmiki, now, who is Valmiki? Well, 
First of all, he was a hunter. And one day, Narada Muni, the sage amongst the demigods, was traveling, and he came across Valmiki, engaged in his usual cruel pursuits. And he stopped and he said, you know, Valmiki, you're going to have to take on a lot of karma because of killing all these animals. You're going to have to suffer in the same way that you made them suffer. And he gave him a vision. Valmiki could see, actually after death, how he was going to suffer because of this. And he says, but Bhagavan, he addressed Narada as Bhagavan. At least he recognized that Narada was enlightened. So he addressed him respectfully as Bhagavan. Actually, I have to do this work to support my family. Otherwise, how are they going to be maintained? So then Narada said, well, go and ask your family, are they willing to take or share, at least, in the karma involved in killing animals? I'll wait here. So Valmiki went home, asked his wife and children and other relatives if they would share in the karma that he was due for his nefarious activities. They all said, no. No, whatever you have done, you have to bear those consequences. So he was like, oh. <laughs> he went back to Narda, told him, and he asked, well, then what can I do to be excused? or to have this karma removed from me. Narada told him, you just chant the name of God, Rama. Now he said, oh, sir, I can't do that. I'm a terrible, sinful man. I'm very fallen and ignorant, and I can't possibly bring myself to such pious activities. So then, Narada, being very intelligent, he tricked him. He said, all right, then, chant the name of death, Mara. So Valmiki said, oh, yes, I could do that. <laughs> so Narada left, and Valmiki sat down under a tree, and he began to chant, Mara, Mara. Mara, 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 Mara. <laughs> this is called Nam Abhas, where one chants the syllables of the name of God intending something else, some other meaning. Yet somehow or other, these syllables emerge from his mouth and are fixed in his mind. And because of that, he gains not exactly the same effect, but a very similar effect to chanting the mantra. So after some time, Narada came back and he said, well, how is your chanting going? And he could see Valmiki was transformed. He was bright and shining, whereas before he had been dark and cruel. So... He blessed Valmiki and went on his way. So one day, Valmiki was walking in the forest on the way to the river or whatever, and he saw two little birds, uh, little lovebirds, and they were, you know, billing and cooing and uh, snuggling and like that. And suddenly, one of them was shot by a hunter with an arrow and fell to the ground. And the other bird, the mate, began to cry in a very piteous way. And Valmiki heard this cry and spontaneously composed a Sanskrit shloka in the same meter. And this meter turned out to be Anushtup. So... <laughs> 
the shloka he composed was a verse of compassion. That, oh, pity the poor bird who lost her mate to the hunter's arrow. And of course, he was feeling a twinge of guilt because he had done the same thing so many times himself. So in this meter of Anushtup are all the shlokas of Aparokshanubhutihi. First, we're going to read three shlokas, which are the invocation. And then I'm going to explain the meaning. Aum prayo mumakshavastesham kechanaiva dvijotama mumukshunam sahasreshu kashchin mucheta sidhyati prayaha almost always mumukshavaha persons interested in liberation Tesham of them kechana some eva indeed dvija utama o best of the brahmanas mumukshunam of those who desire to be liberated sahasreshu in many thousands kashchit someone Mucheta may be actually liberated. Sidhyati is perfect. O best of the Brahmanas, out of many persons who follow religious principles, only a few desire liberation from the material world. Among many thousands who desire liberation, only one may actually achieve liberation giving up material attachment to society, friendship, love, country, home, wife, and children. And among many thousands of such liberated persons, one who can understand the true meaning of liberation is very rare. Aum Tad Vishno Paramang Padang Sada Pashyanti Surayaha Diviva Chaksura Tatam Tadviprasa Vipanyavo Jagrivangsaha Samindate Vishnur Yat Paramang Padam Aum, O oh my Lord, Tad, that, Vishnu, Lord Vishnu, Paramang Padam, the Supreme Destination, Sada, always, Pashyanti, can see, Surayaha, the sun, Diviva, Chakshur, divine eyes, Atatam, broadcast all over the world, Tad, that, Viprasaha, such twice-born devotees, Vipanyavaha, praiseworthy, Jagrivangsaha, aware of everything, Samindhate, reveal, Vishnor, Lord Vishnu, Yatparamang Padang, that supreme destination. Just as the sun's rays in the sky are extended to the mundane vision, in the same way, the wise and learned devotees always see the supreme abode of Lord Vishnu. Because those supremely praiseworthy and spiritually awake devotees are able to see the spiritual world, they are also able to reveal that supreme abode of Lord Vishnu. Aum Apavitra Pavitrova Sarva Vastanga Topiva Yat Smare to Pundari Kaksham Sabahya Bhyantara Suchi Aum, O oh my Lord, Apavitraha, impure, Pavitro, pure, 
va or sarvavastam anything gata becomes api even va or yaha one who smarit remembers pundari kaksham the lotus eyed vishnu saha he bahyabhyantaraha externally and internally shuchihi pure whether one is pure or contaminated and regardless of one's external situation simply by remembering the lotus eyed lord vishnu one certainly becomes internally and externally pure Shri Haring Paramanandam Upadeshtaram Ishwaram Vyapakam Sarvalokanam Karanam Tam Namamyaham Shri Haring to Shri Hari Paramanandam Supreme Bliss Upadeshtaram the first teacher ishwaram supreme ruler vyapakam all pervading sarvalokanam of all worlds karanam cause tang him namamyaham i bow i bow down to him shri hari the destroyer of ignorance the supreme bliss the first teacher ishwara the all pervading one and the cause of all lokas the worlds comprising the universe so you might think this is very strange here is shankaracharya the master and greatest authority on advaita offering respects to Lord Vishnu. Why is he doing that? Well, as we have discussed many times, the different forms of God given in the Shastras are basically metaphors. They are symbols. And what do these symbols stand for? Ultimately, Brahman, the self, Atman, Aum. This is the actual origin of the creation of the universe. So for less intelligent people or less realized people, less knowledgeable or uh, educated people, these truths are put into stories which are based on metaphors like Vishnu, Brahma, Shiva, Shakti, and so many other demigods. But all of these symbols, these metaphors, ultimately indicate Brahman, the self, and this is confirmed by Vedanta Sutra. Vedanta means the conclusion of the Vedas or the ultimate knowledge. Veda also means knowledge. And so Vedanta Sutra opens with the words Atato Brahma Jignasa. Now let us inquire into Brahman. That means Brahman is the actual self, the actual topic, the actual aim of the Vedic knowledge. So if the Vedanta Sutra is the last word of the Vedas, the Rig Veda is the first word, and it opens with the shloka, truth is one but different sages call it by various names. 
this is a clear indication that, okay, we're going to discuss this one truth, but we're going to do it under the cover of various names. These names are symbolic only. You have to look at how they are defined. So if Vishnu is defined as all-pervading, the controller, supreme ruler, Ishwara, uh, that he is the uh, creator of all the lokas, of all the worlds, yet he's described as situated within the heart of the living being. Now, this is, if you take away the symbol of Lord Vishnu with his different arms and weapons and stuff, and you look into functionally what is being described is the self, Atma, the subject of Advaita. So to realize this self, many different methods are given in different scriptures. But they are all rather indirect. Aparokshanubhutihi is one of the unique works that goes directly to the point and talks about Atma Vicharaha. Atma Vichara means inquiry into the self. It basically has the same meaning as Brahma Jignasa in Vedanta. So that's what this work is all about. And we're going to be going verse by verse, section by section, through this extremely profound work, which, if you uh, understand its meaning, you will at once realize that it's the basis of Ramana Maharshi's teaching. Now, Raman Ashramam never published an edition of this book. And I think uh, Richard is of the opinion that they did it in order to give the impression that Ramana Maharshi invented Atma Vichara. But of course, there's nothing new under the sun. All these great truths have been known for thousands of years. <laughs> so here we have confirmation that the technique and even the name Atma Vichara existed in the Vedic tradition for a long time before Ramana Maharshi, which doesn't make him any less significant. Huh? In fact, it increases his stature because it points to the fact that he was well situated in the disciplic lineage from Shankaracharya. So with that uh, invocation, with that introduction, let us begin our study of Aparokshanubhutihi and learn this step-by-step -step method, the sadhana for attaining liberation. Aung Tatsat, Aung Shaktihi Aung.